Hi there, everyone. This is Dan Bressler from the Autism Resource Center at Options and Advocacy for McHenry County. We've had a lot of requests for more information about sensory processing. And so today I wanted to just put out um, a little crash course in the very basics of sensory processing um, just to get us started in that direction. So when we think about sensory processing, it's all about our senses. That's what sensory and senses go together. Um, and actually there are seven senses. A lot of us learned about five of them in school. Um, hearing, touch, sight, smell, and taste. Those are the five that most people know. But there are two other really, really important senses that um, are maybe less commonly talked about and less commonly known. And that's the vestibular sense, which is our sense of balance. It comes from um, the fluid filled canals in our inner ears, which sort of tell us what orientation our head is in. Um, and the proprioceptive sense, which is our kinesthetic sense or our sense of um, movement and our body. Um, and so everyone needs different levels of each type of input. Um, and there's sort of two different thresholds that we can talk about. There's um, the amount of input necessary for our brain to even be aware that the input is, is there. Um, so that, for example, there are sounds, some sounds that are so quiet that we don't even hear them. We don't know that we're hearing them. Um, and then there's above that, um, an amount of input that we need to be comfortable. We have a range generally of, of comfort, comfort levels. So again, for sound between maybe where we can start to hear things, there's, there's a sound level where we prefer to listen to things. And then at some point above that, there's a sound level where, uh, it really becomes very uncomfortable and can be painful. Um, and each, each of those seven senses has that as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some behaviors that are driven by sensory needs. Um, and these are, this is not just related directly to people with autism, but this is everybody. Um, so fidgeting, tapping, pen clicking. Um, we've all been in those meetings where somebody's, you know, maybe bumping their leg or, or clicking their pen over and over again. That's a sensory driven behavior generally. Um, there are some times when we just need some peace and quiet. We need to get away from all of this sensory input that we're receiving. Um, that's a sensory driven behavior. We all make um, food choices. Sometimes we just don't like the texture of a particular food, so we avoid that food. Um, that's the way that peas are for me. I think that the texture is disgusting, so I just choose to stay away from those. That's a sensory driven behavior. Um, sometimes when it's too bright outside, we may wear sunglasses, or if we have a headache on a particular day, we may wear sunglasses, um, and that's a sensory driven behavior. And these goes, go, go on and on, cutting tags off of clothing, um, wearing blankets, or putting blankets on a bed even when it's hot outside. Um, I know I'm guilty of that. I always have a heavy blanket on my bed even in the middle of summer, um, just because for some people that weight can be very comfortable. Um, and so our brains are constantly filtering the sensory information that are coming at us and limiting the amount of information that actually reaches our consciousness that we become aware of. Um, and one difference that's very common in people with autism versus um, people without autism is that that filtering process can be a little bit different. And so that can result in some over or under sens sensitivity to sensory inputs um, for people with autism, meaning that their brain may be filtering out more information than is, than is typical. And so they might not feel or register things, um, different types of sensory input that some others of us might um, register. And they may need more or less of a particular type of input um, in order to be comfortable and feel safe than many of us would need. Um, and so it's also important to know that sensory needs change over time and depending on the situation. And so if, you, if you've got one person with autism um, who you, you think that you've really got them pegged and yes, they need uh, this weighted blanket and they need headphones all the time, um, that may be true in most situations, but given a different situation, their sensory me needs may actually change. The example that I always give for this is that uh, my background is as a music therapist. I love music. Um, if I'm driving, especially in summer with the windows down, I like to have music cranked really loud. Um, and that's very comfortable for me and and it it makes the driving experience more enjoyable for me. But it seems like the second that I hit the city limits of Chicago, if I'm driving into the city, um, I have to turn the music off because I cannot see 
if there's music playing in that in that hectic situation of city driving. Um, so my sensory needs for that auditory input is variable depending on the context that I'm in. Um, when I'm in a low stress environment, when I'm not getting much visual input, my auditory threshold is, is quite high and I like a lot of auditory input. But if I'm under stress in some way or I have a lot of visual input like the like highway driving near Chicago, for example, if I'm in that higher stress environment, suddenly my auditory threshold goes much lower and I really cannot have that kind of input if I'm going to be able to focus on the task in front of me. Um, we can also look at how even in a situation that seems like it's the same, our sensory behaviors may change. For example, if you have identical temperatures in the fall and in the spring, so for example, let's say 64 degrees, you may know that after we've been through the summer and we've been out in t-shirts for months, um, when you get a 63 degree day in fall, you're going to be bundling up like crazy, right? You're going to have that, that fall jacket out. You're going to be you're going to have your jeans and your hoodies and, and whatever else. Whereas after a long winter, the first day that we get into the 60s, if it gets to 63, there, there are all kinds of people out there in shorts and t-shirts. Um, and so that exact same temperature, even though it seems like it would be the same sensory environment, right, can actually lead to different um, sensory driven behaviors and different sensory needs based on the context surrounding that um, situation. So in general, we can sort of sort sensory driven behaviors into two categories, and that's sensory seeking and sensory avoiding. Sensory seeking is, is obviously when we're looking for more of a particular type of input. Sensory avoiding is when we're looking for less of a particular type of input. Um, so looking at some examples, um, wearing sunglasses is a sensory avoiding behavior. We're trying to filter out and limit the amount of light coming into our eyes. Um, swinging generally is a sensory seeking behavior. That's, that's vestibular input, right? It's that rocking, it, it's our sense of balance. Um, and so that's seeking that vestibular input. A lot of times we see um, kids who really like to cuddle or, or get really big tight hugs. That's a sensory seeking behavior. They're seeking proprioceptive input. Again, that's that kinesthetic input. It generally involves um, input into our muscles and joints and that more deep pressure input. Whereas tactile input is more on, on just the skin layer. It's lighter touches. Um, we may see people putting their hands over their ears or wearing headphones or um, this isn't just people with autism. Again, you know, in an office setting, um, a lot of times if you're in a noisy office environment, lots of cubicles or something like this, um, you may see some people with earbuds in they, and they may or may not be listening to music, but that's a, an auditory avoiding behavior. They're trying to block out all of the auditory distractions around them to help them focus. Um, and it's important to know when you're thinking about sensory behaviors and maybe some of them can be... Um, unexpected behaviors or distressing behaviors or sometimes unsafe behaviors, um, and we're looking to change them, it's important to know that a child's brain is going to find a way to get what it needs. So it's up to us as the adults in their lives um, to create appropriate and safe opportunities for that type of input. So for example, if we have a kid um, who's crashing into walls or who is you know, jumping off a couch onto a floor, they may be looking for that proprioceptive input, that deep muscle and joint input. And so we may give them a more appropriate way of getting that input through a weighted blanket um, or a similar safe um, tool that can help them get that input that they're seeking. And when we give that to them appropriately, we may see a decrease in some of those other sensory driven behaviors that we're concerned about. Um, a lot of times in school settings, we see students who are always up and moving. They're sharpening their pencil seven times in a class or they're, you know, they just can't sit still or they can't focus. Um, and a lot of times seeking that movement, it may be vestibular, it may be proprioceptive, but ultimately if we give them an appropriate way to get that movement while still at their desk in their learning environment, um, we may see a decrease in some of those more distracting behaviors. So we may do that through um, a wiggle cushion, which is just a little cushion that they put on their chair that, that gives, gives them the opportunity to move around a little bit. Um, we may see therabands on the bottom of the chairs that they can kick while they're sitting at their desk so that they can get that input in a more, appropriately, in a more appropriate and less um, distracting uh, manner. 
A lot of times we see things like hand fidgets um, that can replace some of that pen clicking or tapping or any kind of um, small movement based behavior. Sometimes fidgets can help us focus. I'm a big proponent of using fidgets myself. Um, and then also building breaks into a day can help some of our students who get really overwhelmed. If we're seeing um, sort of shutdown behavior or hiding in the bathroom sometimes at school or behaviors that seem to be avoiding input, if we can build opportunities for that during the day in appropriate ways and let those students know when those opportunities are going to be, we may see a decrease in those unexpected behaviors. So if they know that they, that they just need to go 15 minutes before they can have a break where they can sit in a beanbag and put some headphones on and just chill for a few minutes and, and get away from all that input, that may help them stay focused um, during the time that we're asking them to stay focused. Um, so when your brain is receiving too much input, not enough input, or the wrong type of input, um, it can revert to its primary job, which is always keeping you safe. That's what your brain was you know, evolutionarily designed to do back when we were you know, out on the plains trying to keep ourselves safe from predators. When our brain received distressing sensory information, whether that, that was a rustle in the bushes or you know, that feeling that it's too quiet or whatever, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to revert to that fight, flight, or freeze instinct to keep us safe. And so that's what we see when we see sensory meltdowns. That means that that brain um, was receiving too much input, not enough input, or the wrong kind of input, and it went to survival mode. Um, and so during this time, our behavior is less about choices that are driven by the frontal lobes of our brain, which has to do with reason and, and decision-making and consciousness, and it's driven more by our old brain, the, more at the brainstem level, um, which is all about instinct and keeping us safe, and we really don't have much control about what happens at that level. So during these times, it's important to know that children and people generally um, don't always have control over what they're doing. They're not making conscious choices necessarily. Their brain is just keeping them safe. It's, it's completely overridden any decision-making ability that that person has. And so we may see also see decreases in other um, non-survival skills, like communication skills, for example. We may, a student or a person who is usually very communicative and very verbal, we may see them not be able to speak during these fight, flight, or freeze moments. Um, Similarly, somebody who is very good at understanding information, understanding directions, and is usually a really good direction follower, may not follow directions during this time, either because their brain isn't even allowing the auditory input, those directions, to, to reach the part of their brain where they would be able to control what they're doing and following that direction, or they may just not have control over their body at that time because um, their old brain, so to speak, has um, taken over. Um, and so when you're in this situation, either in a, a very intense sensory meltdown, a very intense fight, flight, or freeze moment, or just in a lower level of sensory distress, sensory discomfort, um, you know, less information is going to be able to make it through to our conscious um, decision-making reasonable part of our brain. Um, and that means that we're, we're going to have a much harder time learning. We're going to have a hard time understanding what people are saying to us. Um, and in general, we are just not going to be operating at our full potential. Um, and so th the important takeaway for that is just that, you know, it's important that we as adults try to, to set up situations to lead to the greatest level of sensory comfort for our students. And it's not just about being comfortable, it's about feeling safe, it's about feeling secure. And when we do that, um, kids are going to be more able to learn, more able to understand, and more able to perform to their uh, potential because there's not all of this other stuff getting in the way. Um, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why, anyway, it's so important to consider um, sensory processing, to consider the sensory experiences of your child or the child that you're working with, and to incorporate this into your overall um, sort of thought process about a bunch of different situations, including um, what we may identify as challenging or undesired or inappropriate behaviors. We need to consider if there is a sensory um, motivation or a sensory-based cause for that behavior. So in addition to thinking about 
all of the great pairing and behavior basics and reinforcement systems that we've talked about in other videos, we also need to bring in this idea of thinking about whether or not there's a sensory component to it and how can we care for that child's um, sensory processes, sens sensory processing system as well as their um, more behavioral side. So I hope that that quick sensory crash course was helpful for you. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below or to reach out to your Options and Advocacy Service Coordinator. Um, even during this time of pandemic, we're still here to help you. Um, just need to reach out by phone or email um, and we're, we're happy to help out however we can. Um, so that's it for today and I hope you have a good day. Hey.